Hi guys, right now I'm going to do one video to cover three nematodes. I just finished a series of three videos on tapeworms, but nematodes are a little bit different. Instead of being flat, these guys are cylindrical and they are non-segmented. Nematodes, the last time we talked about them was probably Ascaris, and Ascaris essentially looks like a bowl full of spaghetti. Um, nematodes are the most common helminths recognized in the United States, um, and they are a cause of intestinal nematode in, um, disease. Other countries, nematode infections can often be found in blood and tissue, and there they can cause really de devastating diseases. They're really large in size, they're cylindrical, no segments, and this kind of gives them the common name of roundworm. Um, these parasites live primarily as adult worms, in the intestinal tract of permissive animals. Okay, so not everywhere. Remember, parasites are very um, picky. Um, and typically, we're going to figure out a patient has a nematode when they've either voided eggs in the feces or potentially even the worm. We're going to discuss three genus of roundworms here. We're going to talk about Toxocara. And with Toxocara, we're going to talk about Toxocara catus and Toxocara canis. We're going to talk about um, Ankylostoma. And we're going to talk about Nicator. Okay, so most of this I already just told you. When we think about it, you're basically thinking about basically spaghetti. That's kind of what it looks like. All right, Toxocara. The Toxocara species, these are commonly associated with either dogs or cats, okay? So Toxocara canis is basically dog ascaris or roundworm. It is a common cause of visceral larva migrans, which is the clinical syndrome, which I'll talk about. Toxocara caddy, which is associated with cats, is also a cause of visceral larva migrans. So when we talk about deworming our dogs and deworming our cats, it's actually an important preventative step to avoid worms. Um, it's naturally parasitic in the intestines of dogs and cats, depending on which species you're talking about. And we are actually, again, an accidental host. The infective form is the egg. The larval form is unable to mature in humans. So instead, they kind of migrate to different tissues um, I should say tissues, not humans. I mean, they also go to different humans, but the more important thing right here is different tissues, and that's what's actually going to cause disease. So who gets infected? Basically, anytime you have dogs and cats present, dogs and cats living together, the eggs are a threat to the humans. This is especially true for children. Why? As I've talked about before, children essentially have a death wish. They are constantly picking things up and putting them in their mouths, no matter what their mothers and fathers tell them not to do. And they are never washing their hands. Again, no matter what their mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and whoever else loves them, tells them to do. So because of this, they're basically putting contaminated soil with potentially Toxocara infested feces in their mouths. I know, great thing to think about. Okay, so what's the clinical syndrome? Thankfully, most patients are asymptomatic, but I will point out, even asymptomatic patients may show some eosinophilia on blood work, okay? And that's really just your body fighting off the worm if you were exposed. Patients may experience significant disease, and that really only occurs if you've got a high parasite burden or the location of where the larvae are is particularly problematic. Um, the larvae are actually going to cause basically an eosinophilic, e, oh, I did that wrong, eosinophilic granuloma, okay? So if this eosinophilic granuloma is in a poor, in a bad spot, or it leads to tissue necrosis, that's when we're actually gonna see disease, okay? So visceral larva migrans. Most often, this is gonna occur in those very young children who are putting things in their mouths, okay? The result is typically hepatitis or pneumonitis because basically the larva are gonna migrate through the liver and the lungs. You can pretty much get heavy infection and then see fever, anorexia, malaise, irritability, and you may see some hepatomegaly, right? Because we're going through the liver respiratory symptoms because we're going through the lungs, and we're talking about mass eosinophil activation. So we need to worry about thing like, things like urticaria, um, and those could cause lesions that are rather paritic, um, and eosinophilia. 
I didn't talk about ocular larva migraines. Um, this actually can be the sole manifestation of visceral larva migraines. This happens in individuals without any sort of antecedent history of VLM. Basically, it's going to occur in older children and adolescents. Why? As we get older, we wash our hands more, we stop putting things in our mouths. But what do we do? We itch our eyes, we, move, we touch our faces, we do things like that. The larva localize in the eye and they produce this granulomatous response. Common symptoms are going to be unilateral vision impairment because we're going to get it in one eye because it was on one hand, right? Um, and that can lead to failing vision and subsequent strabismus. Um, you may also see uveitis or papillitis or endophthalm can't pronounce this word, endophthalmitis. Um, you can see some ocular lesions, and the ocular lesions actually tend to resemble retinoblastoma, and that can lead to blindness if the retina is actually invaded. How are you going to diagnose it? A little bit tricky. Remember, in this case, the worm isn't maturing, so we're not waiting for something to pass out. So you're going to do it based on clinical findings and eosinophilia. If you have these symptoms and mass eosinophilia, you might be dealing with this. You can also do serology. Um, you can do serologic findings and you can also pair that with, okay, I know they were exposed to something that's a reservoir. Um, ELISA appears to be the best assay for serology. You can also examine the feces of the pets, right? But examining the feces of the patient, not generally helpful because egg laying, laying adults don't appear in the human. So if we're gonna do a fecal examination, it needs to be on the family dog, not on the like six year old. Um, tissue examination of the larva might be helpful, but it might not be, because if you don't sample the right part of the tissue, you might not see anything. How do we treat it? Um, basically you treat the symptoms. The antiparasitic agents don't seem to be very helpful here. Um, but if you do get a rupture or too much eosinophilia, you can use corticosteroid therapy. And that actually can be life-saving if the patient has serious pulmonary, myocardial, or CNS involvement. Okay, so the other one that I was going to talk about is ankylostoma and duodenali and Nicator americanus. These are the old world and new world hookworms, okay? So these are these creepy guys. I always think these guys look particularly menacing. Um, for both of them, the infective form is a filariform larvae. And here's what's really creepy. You ever like to walk barefoot in the grass? Like you're on vacation in like a nice humid area, like South Carolina or Georgia, and you're walking on some nice soft grass. There may be worms in that grass that can bite right through your skin. That's literally what happens. These teeth are very nasty and they can just penetrate completely intact skin. And oops, now you have a hookworm. Um, the diagnostic form, if you were to walk barefoot on the grass, is a non bile stained segmented egg. Now, here's where things get even, even creepier. Okay, so. The worm bites through your intact skin. The larva then enters your circulation and is carried up to your lungs. You then <coughs> cough up the larva and then swallow it. This is called auto infection. When you swallow it, it goes to your small intestine and that's where the adult form of the worm forms. Auto infection, so it bites your foot travels through your bloodstream to your lungs you cough it into your mouth you swallow it and then it attacks your intestine you just can't win here okay so once that adult forms it is capable of laying thousands of eggs per day and those eggs are released in the feces where do we find it shady well-drained soil in humid locations so wear your shoes people um, there are a lot of infections with this one, 900 million individuals worldwide infected, and that includes about 700,000 in the U.S. So this is one we do see here. Okay, so what actually happens? Well, where they actually penetrate, you can see an allergic reaction and rash. So basically where they bit in with their creepy little teeth, okay? So these things, they bite your skin and you get a nice little rash. Once they go to your lungs, we're worried about pneumonitis and eosinophilia, okay? Once they're in the GI tract, we're worried about gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And actually, because these things are 
feeding on us, they're feeding on our blood, we actually have to worry about blood loss. So blood loss to feeding worms can cause a microcytic hypochromic anemia um, because they actually feed a significant amount and they replicate pretty quickly. So how do we get rid of these little suckers? Um, first off, diagnosis and treatment. Stool examination, if you find those non-bile stained segmented eggs, you know you got a hookworm. If you're in America, it's probably Nicator americanus. If you're over in Europe, it's probably Ankylostoma um, duodenale. How are you going to treat it? Albendazole, and then you'll be done with it. 